Okay, um, this is a new series on how to better study the Bible. I'm trying to write each lesson to where it's useful to you if you're brand new to this whole Bible thing, or it's useful to you if you've been digging into it for decades and decades and decades. And so that's one mission or goal behind my presentation. A second one is to um, uh, make sure that each class offers you something of substance and builds upon the prior classes. But by the same token, each one still stands solo because we have a lot of people who come in and out during the summer, which means... I urge you to attend regularly because you'll miss some of it if you don't catch the building. But you can always attend via the internet or however you want to. And don't ever refrain from inviting people in, even if they don't have the earlier lessons, because I'll work hard to make sure each lesson's encaptured within itself. So with that, Better Bible Study is what we're doing. And this is session one, which I've entitled, Why? What? And how? And you won't be surprised to find that those are the main points I've got. Now, all of us who are alive, raise your hand if that includes you, that's most of you. All of us who are alive are in this cycle of life. You know, one of my favorite sayings is, I have never been, never in my entire life have I been as old as I am right now. Um... Thank you, Miss Carolyn, for laughing. And Miss Carolyn, I'll never be this young again. See? Um, that's the cycle of life. We're all familiar with those pictures that show us starting from infancy and going, uh, uh, assuming we make it, into old age. And, and that's something that's happening to all of us, whether we realize it or not. Uh, I, I'm... I'm truly not as young as I used to be, and, and I feel it. Mike Moriarty uh, is, is, goes down in the annals of humor in my brain for telling me one day, he said, Lanier, when you reach my age, you hurt all the time. He said, if I wake up in the morning and I don't hurt somewhere, I do this <sighs> to make sure I'm alive. But I'm reminded of that as I was thinking of how to introduce this lesson. Because one of my good friends, who's one of the best Bible scholars I know, is Tom Wright, N.T. Wright. And Tom has written more books than many people have ever read. Tom is an incredibly rich writer. And Tom wrote a book entitled The Challenge of Jesus. And this was Rediscovering who Jesus was and is. It was a book. He wrote it. And I was uh, at dinner with Tom and his sweet wife, Maggie. And uh, he, he started regaling me with a story of Maggie saying to him, well, what are you writing now? And he said, I'm writing a book on who is Jesus. And she said, I thought you did that 10 years ago. He said, I did. Maggie said, well, has Jesus changed? And Tom said, no, but I have. And I like that. And so you can read simply Jesus, a new vision of who he was. And you'll find things in there that weren't in the first Jesus book. Because Tom has changed in this life cycle. And all of us in the life cycle, regardless of where we are, can grow if we spend more time studying the Bible. We will grow in who we are. We will grow in how the Bible applies because our mental makeup, the, the way our neurons are aligned, the way our brains work, we tend to interpret things by where we are when those events are happening. And so you're in a different place right now than you've ever been in your life. In at least some way. 
And if you will study the Bible right now, you will begin to understand it in light of where you are today. And it will open up insights and freshness that assist you today. One of my biggest points I like to make to high school students who are graduating is that they continue to stay in the Word. Because the temptation is to go to college or university or into the working world, the vocational world, to go out there and to stop that Bible study that they were in because of the group where they were hanging at church. And they, they, they'll stop for a week. But then a week turns into a month. And then a month into a year. And you know the expression, uh, the days are long but the years fly by. And what will happen is, over the course of time, after a year, five years, they will find that they used to be here, but now they've grown up and they're here. And they'll look back at the Bible as something for children. Because it never grew with them. And so their brain lives in spaces that aren't infused with the Word of God. And that's not what we want to do. So I can't, we can't fix the past. But everyone in here can fix the future. And so we can make a commitment right now that we're going to grow in our study of God's Word. And that is what the, the, the driving force behind this class is. So let's break this apart into three sections for today. Care to guess what they are? <laughs> why what and how <laughs> and then we'll be done for the day all right let's start with the why Paul wrote this to one of his protégés now we're talking the apostle Paul the apostle Paul wrote to Timothy one of his protégés and said indeed all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. That the man, anthropos is, is men and women, that the people of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Now that's amazing. I put it up there because I wanted you to see the words, but I read it. Because I wanted you to hear it. Because general rule or side rule, I'm sticking a rule on the side here. That's the ruler for the side rule. Side rule, important rule. Number one, read slowly. When I was in seventh grade, the last half of seventh grade, I had Miss Jacqueline Dickey as my reading teacher. I was not real fond of her. I mean, as a person, I'm sure she was great. But as a teacher, she was harsh and she was mean or so little Mark Lanier perceived her. And she had this little machine. And the machine would put words on the screen and it would highlight those words as you're going along so that you had to read at a certain speed. And she put us into different categories. There were the slow readers and there were the fast readers. And she wanted us to become fast readers 
Do you remember the Evelyn Wood reading program to teach you to read fast? There are very few times you need to read this fast. About the only time that occurs even in my memory is when my buddy Tim down here was in an airplane and uh, uh, it was one of these little single engine airplanes and the pilot turns around as they're going in to land and says, uh, be buckled in tight, the landing gear won't come down, we're going to crash land this puppy. And I was talking to Tim afterwards, and he did survive. And he said, Lanier, I not only had my seatbelt, I took the safety cargo net and wrapped it around me. I wrapped everything I could, and I got my Bible out, and Evelyn Wood would have been proud. I speed read that whole thing cover to cover. <laughs> okay, so there's a time maybe to read through fast. But general rule, read it slow don't let your mind skate over some of those words because you're going to miss some important stuff so let's go back Paul says but as for you continue in what you have learned learned what you have learned so there's something that you need to learn that's adding to what we know what we've learned so I want to learn more but not only continue in what you've learned but also what you have firmly believed that Greek word pistuo for believed or pistis in the noun form or this is a verb form pistuo is is the word that that means what, what you're con convinced about, yes, but also what you trust. We, we sometimes think the word believe means just some mental agreement with. But that Greek word means something beyond that. It means what you trusted. We use the English word believed a little bit like that. I had someone send me an email recently saying, uh, I can't believe you took this legal position. It is opposite of everything that, that you stand for. And I am ashamed of you for taking this legal position. And I emailed them back and said, do you believe in me so little that you bought into that rumor? I don't support that. Here's my press release where I said I don't agree with it. That's a vicious rumor. You need to believe in me. Well, I don't use the word believe there like, you need to think that I exist. I'm using, you need to trust in me, right? So we still use the word that way, but, but we got to be real careful. So Paul says, continue in the things you've learned and what you've trusted in, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you've been equated, acquainted with the sacred writings sacred writings this is something this is Paul referencing the Old Testament scripture the Bible as it existed at that time those aren't ordinary writings they're sacred that word sacred is conveys the idea of of, of something different and set apart and holy these are holy writings. You've been acquainted with them since you were a child. And they will make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Well, that's a pretty good reason to be studying the scriptures. Not just to find salvation, but to be wise for salvation. To, 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 to have a way that it changes who you are. It transforms you. It takes that person with these really sharp edges and starts to sand them down into smooth. It takes that person with a heart of stone and starts to soften it up. It takes the volatile temper and begins to develop it into patience 
it makes you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And then he says, all scripture, all scripture is breathed out by God. Not part of it, but all of it. The word breathed out here is one Greek word. It starts with, it's a compound word of two Greek words. The first one is theo, which is God. And the next one is pneumo, which is breathed. And when you put those together, you've got this word God breathed or breathed out by God. Now, this is the only time in the entire Bible that the word is used. But it's not an uncommon word. It's a word that's been used by other Greek writers. And Paul is taking from Greek literature a word that's been used for hundreds of years to indicate something that has God breathing into a sacred situation. Generally, something that's a, an oracle or a writing. So it says the Old Testament, the, the Scripture, the, old, the Bible at the time, and I think by extension, even the Bible that had not yet been written, it's still a holy sacred writing, so we can apply it to the whole Bible, even though Paul's thinking in terms of the Bible at his time. All Scripture is breathed out by God, and it's profitable. Everybody wants to make a profit. It's profitable. It will increase to your gain. If we study Scripture rightly, it will increase and teach us about life. It will reproof us. Reprove is, uh, uh, is uh, kind of like correction. It's a modification word. It's a word that says it's going to help fix you. It's going to correct you. And it's going to train you in righteousness. Coach Max, where's Coach Max? Right over here. Stand up for a second. Y'all know Coach Max. Everybody in here knows, everybody on the internet knows Coach Max. That's Coach Max. Coach Max, how old are you? 77 years old. And I do not want to arm wrestle him. 77 years old, how many miles did you ride yesterday? 12. He's got a really good car, it was easy. Um, <laughs> 12 miles on that exercise bike. He's coached high schoolers, he's coached college kids. By the way, I think he's being inducted into the college football for Westchester or someplace Hall of Fame. It's like one of two in a hundred year history, one of two football coaches to go in their athletic Hall of Fame. But he's coached on college level. He's coached on the pro level. He's coached in a Super Bowl for the Buffalo Bills under Wade Phillips. He has trained and trains people. He oversees a region of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes right now. We went over to Hull, England on a mission trip. And coach, they had a, 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 a real um, American football team. And coach went out there and coached them. And told them about training and technique and all of this. Why? You train to be better at what's important. You train to be better at what you do. I would love to be more righteous than I am today. So how can I train to be more righteous than I am today? One way, spend time in Scripture. Study the Word. It is inspired by God and it's profitable for training in righteousness. That the person of God may be complete. Whoa! Complete. Teleos in the Greek is this idea of of completeness or ripeness, maturity. 
can even mean perfection. And Paul's not saying that we're going to get perfect out of this. But he's saying it's going to make you more mature. It's going to ripen you. It's going to grow you up. The person of God is going to be not only complete, grown up, growing up, maturing, but will be equipped for every good work. That means every good thing that God has for you to do, you will better be able to do it if you're spending time in the Word. You will be equipped for every good work, not just some of them, every one, every good. You know, if, in Paul, in, in his letter to the Ephesians, <clears throat> said that, that God has saved us for good works that he prepared beforehand for us to do them. See, God's got something for every one of you to do. You're watching this on the internet, I can assure you, God has something he wants you to do uniquely to do maybe no more than pray for someone on a morning that you need to pray for them maybe no more than helping wash some dishes and set some things up on a day it needs to be done we don't know what but God's got good things planned for you and you will be more equipped to do them if you spend time in the word now that's what reading slow can tell you all scripture and just read slow breathed out by God it's profitable for teaching it's for reproof it's for correction it's for training in righteousness you'll be complete equipped for every good work all of that is the blessing of scripture now I want to jump back to where this started where Paul's mind was when he went to this because it started with this all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted Say, well, who's signing up for that program? Anybody who wants to live in truth. The reality of this world is there's persecution for everybody. It's just a question of do you want to walk through it alone or with God? There are unique persecutions if you're a Christian. There are times in my life where uniquely because of faith, persecution has come. But that's okay because of who's in us and who's walking through it with us. Everyone will be persecuted while evil and imposters will go from bad to worse. See, they're getting worse, we're getting better. They're deceiving and being deceived. They're going to be persecuted too. But we're growing in righteousness because that's where Paul's flow goes because we're spending time in the word so growing in scripture will grow us in life let me give you another passage and this passage is from an early church sermon and I got this picture of Jarrett from a couple of weeks ago so that was early church <laughs> but I'm not quoting Jarrett I'm just uh, plugging him one of my favorite preachers. For the word of God, that's sacred writings, scripture, is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit. You say, well, I'll get that. Well, you can't really divide the difference between soul and spirit. And some people say, well, yeah, I've got it all figured out. It's, here's the system, body, soul, spirit, da, 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 da. It doesn't work that way in the, the, the Greek. It just doesn't. We can't really tell where spirit stops and soul starts in the Greek. But the Bible does. The word of God pierces even to a division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, discerns the thoughts and intentions of the heart. That's pretty amazing stuff. The thoughts and intentions of the heart. Now at the time Paul, or I, that's not Paul, that's Hebrews. Um, at the time the Hebrew sermon was being preached, there were other Jewish writings that were common and well known. And one of them is uh, a book called The Wisdom of Solomon. And this is actually in the Apocrypha and uh, was well known at the time. And in The Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 18... It's got this long passage 
about the, the time that Israel was in captivity in Egypt. And while they were in captivity in Egypt, they, um, you'll recall the angel of death comes to visit and take the firstborn. And that's the final plague that causes Pharaoh to relent and let Moses take the Israelites out. And it's really interesting because as it was written here, It says, this translation, While all things were enveloped in peaceful silence, this is the night of the Passover, and night was midway through her swift course, your all-powerful logos, logos is in the Greek, it means uh, your all-powerful word. This is word. Your all-powerful word was midway through her swift, or your all-powerful word (laughs) out of the heavens from the royal throne leapt like a relentless warrior into the midst of the land marked for destruction, bearing your unambiguous decree as a sharp sword. See, the idea of, of God's word being a sword as is referenced here is one that was already in use in Jewish thought and writing. The Word of God. Whoops, how did I get to that? The Word of God is a sword that can bring destruction, that can pierce between joint and marrow, soul and spirit, can discern thoughts, it can discern intentions. We want that Word of God working in us to help us in our life, to grow us, to train us. It makes sense of what Paul was saying would be happening to us if we spend time with this sword of God. Look at the Old Testament. Um, Look at the, let me get past that slide, bump there. Isaiah the prophet. This is a passage a lot of people know, but read it slowly. As the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return there. Last night we had a really big storm. And there's, uh, and I went out this morning. There's a lot of water and rain on the ground. There's mud where I don't need mud right now. And so I thought, well, maybe while I'm at church, it'll just bounce back up. No, no. No, <laughs> doesn't return. It waters the earth. Now you may be saying, but what about evaporation? Okay, cut me some slack here. We got some poetic imagery happening. Making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Those are good things. We want our seeds to sprout. Our daughter Rebecca called me on FaceTime yesterday. Do you know why? She was picking tomatoes out of her garden and wanted to show me she showed me the cucumber plants she showed me the stuff we planted the seeds together they've been watered and they're giving forth bread to the eater good things happen from that rain that falls and so shall be my word that goes out from my mouth The Word of God, Scripture, won't come back empty. It doesn't evaporate without first accomplishing that which it went to do, which is going to bring forth life, going to sprout within us good things. So we want it to accomplish that which God purposed See, it's God's purpose, it's what God's about. We want it to succeed in the thing for which God sent it. That's the power. Look, you want God to accomplish things in your life? Get in the Word. How many people say, well, I wish God would work through me more, but won't get into the Word? 
God says, you get in my word and, and it will accomplish that. I'll work through you more. It will, you will succeed in what I send you to do. All right, so uh, uh, set that aside. Uh, why? Let's look at the what real quick. What is the Bible? I'm holding up a Protestant Bible. The Protestant Bible is slightly different than that used within the Catholic Church because the Catholic Bible has a section in it called the Apocrypha. And we will talk about that in due course. But the numbers that I'm giving you, and so we've got a lot of people in here and on the internet that are Catholic. And, and I'm going to be speaking out of the Protestant scriptures as opposed to the Catholic here, think of it this way. Um, in a sense, there are three sections in, a, in a, a Catholic Bible. Okay? You've got one section, which is the old, what I'll call the Old Testament. You've got a second section, which is what we'll call the Apocrypha. And you've got a third section, which is the New Testament. The Protestant scriptures use this and this, but this for the Protestant is part of history instead of the Bible. These are used for historical and valuable devotional material. You know, they help us understand. I, I just read from the Apocrypha about the sword they help us understand things it's it's so this is an important aspect but it's not what I'm referencing in these statistics I'm about to give you what I want to tell you is that the Bible is a library it's not a single book think of it as a library and you're 20 miles from the starting line it is a library of books and in the Protestant Bible you have 66 books we're missing the 14 of the Apocrypha those 66 books are divided into two sections you have the Old Testament and you have the New Testament now who came up with these words Old Testament and New Testament they weren't in the original Bible we will talk about all of that when we get to it spoiler alert it was a lawyer okay <clears throat> We will talk about that when we get to it. But for our purposes right now, let's just think of this as a library divided up. 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament, 14 are in the Apocrypha. Now, like a library, the books are in sections. And the, the, God didn't say, put the books in this order. That's a human creation. It's a human creation, and as a result, some Bibles have them in different orders. There's no established, sanctioned order for the books. And if you think about it, the Hebrew Bible was originally, as was most of the New Testament, letters or scrolls. So it's not like you're going up to the scroll cabinet and, and all right, we're going to alphabetize these. We're going to put, you know, and you start alphabetizing the scrolls. Or No, 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 you got them in bad order. I mean, they're, it's, they're, they're like the spices. Unless you are really like my wife, most spices are not kept in alphabetical order. <laughs> Becky, where are you? Ours are, aren't they? They're in alphabetical order, aren't they? Uh-huh. Cinnamon, clove, cinnamon's in front of clove. It's C-I instead of C-L. Um, and I love it because I can find them fast. Like a library, though, these books are in sections. Some of them we don't even know. We don't know why the letters of Paul are ordered the way they are in the Bible. There are two main theories. We'll talk about that later. This is just to give you an idea. This is an overview. There are different genres of writing now we know this in the world right think about it for a moment think in modern genres what kind of books do you like do you like history books 
I mean, I can, I, the little book of history is, is a great little book. Love little books. Uh, do you like, uh, what's another genre? How-to books. Um, how to read a book. How to assemble a toaster. That's a big one. Uh, how to, you know, there are how-to books or manuals or instructions. There's a whole genre of writing of fiction. We have a wonderful fiction writer here in class. Right there. How many books? No, not in the Bible, by her. 92? 92. 92. So we have fiction. Uh, Chronicles of Narnia. That's not in among her 92. Um, fiction books. There's poetry books. You know, this book, uh, 101 Famous Poems, I had, my mom had it growing up, and she taught us a poem out of it. If you watch my video, Thoughts for the Day, on Friday, I think it was Friday, maybe it was Thursday, Thursday or Friday, I did the proverb about the, be wary when you're walking down the street, uh, and there's the adulterous woman because she's going to lure and entice you, and I said, don't flirt with sin, that video, Thought for the Day. My mom reminded me later, she said, you know, the way I tried to teach you that concept and I, when you were young, before you knew what an adulterous woman was, and I said, I don't, I don't know. She said, I made you memorize the poem, The Spider and the Fly. Do you know that? Steve Taylor's laughing. He knows that poem. Won't you step into my parlor, said the spider to the fly. Tis the prettiest little parlor that ever you did spy. Oh, no, no. The way into my parlor is up a winding stair, and I have plenty beautiful things to show you when you're there. And finally, she captures the fly, and fly yells for help, and it doesn't work, and he gets killed. That was my childhood, and it explains a lot. <laughs> Poetry. <laughs> While my mom's teaching us that, my dad's teaching us poems like, roses are red, violets are blue, most poems rhyme, but this one doesn't. <laughs> um, there are plays. Uh, old, famous Greek plays. Euripides is one of the famous Greek playwrights, uh, 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 Sophocles, or no, it was Aeschylus. Aeschylus wrote Eumenides. It's one of the Orestian Trilogy plays. It's the third volume, I think, in the Orestian Trilogy. In fact, if you know this, at lunch today, you can really crack up the table by saying these two Greek guys were walking down the street, and one of them looked at the other and said, Euripides? And the other one said, yeah, Eumenides. So, t like, Okay, they went to the dry cleaners, and he handed him his toga. And the dry cleaner guy said, Euripides? And he says, yeah, Eumenides. Euripides. Okay, fine. You don't have to use it. It was a free one. It's a free joke. Ancient genres include this stuff and more. There's history. There's how-to books. There's fiction books. There's poetry books. There's plays. There are law books. All of those are in the Bible. God used all of these different genres in the Bible. And, and, and it makes it rich to read. Yeah, I quoted from the New Testament book of Hebrews. That, most scholars think, and I certainly believe, was a New Testament sermon. You got a sermon in the Bible. Some people think that the Song of Solomon was an Old Testament play. There are certain psalms that are done to be responsive readings like a play. There are some psalms that are written to be memory tests and teach you how to do the alphabet. There are how-to instruction manuals. Here's what you need to do. There are letters that are just written to edify, to expound theology. There are all sorts of different genres in the, new, in the Bible that we get to look at and use. And it's a wonderful thing. Now, I want to take another step to something. In the 1950s, intellectually, there was major movement in the understanding of human language and the brain. It had started with a guy named B.F. Skinner. And Skinner was a behaviorist. And Skinner, on the development of language in a kid, said, kid learns their behavior and language skills by the people they're around. And there's an element of truth to that, but it's not fully true. And along came Noam Chomsky at MIT. 
And Noam Chomsky, who's still alive, I might add, was the first one in, in academia to really push and, and advocate this idea that language is innate within a human being. It's not something we merely acquire through behavioral contact. We are pre-wired for it. He kicked that guy out. Did you see that? Watch that. Bam! <laughs> Bam! They didn't get along well. It makes that even funnier. And I mean, B.F. Skinner's like dead. He's not going to complain. All right. There's a uniquely human innate ability and desire to acquire and use language. We're hardwired that way. That's the way our brains are made. By the way, if the divine one knows we're hardwired and our brains are made that way, doesn't it make a lot of sense he'd use language to communicate to us? The idea that their scripture shouldn't strike anyone as, oh, come on, like God's going to actually put scripture. Well, yeah, we're wired to hear it. We're wired to read it. It's the way we think. It is not a coincidence that the Greek word logos or logos, which means word, is the word from which we get logic. Because we think in words, at least our conscious thought is. So it makes sense that we've got more social media than I know what is. I mean, do you know what all these are? I got Facebook, I got Pinterest, I got Instagram, I got YouTube, I got Spotify, I got uh, Twitch. I got no idea what B is. Uh, that's uh, Flitter or Twitter or whatever. That's something. I don't even know. These are social media accounts. It's going to take David to tell me what they are. But I'll tell you, even at the age of two, kids are communicating. These two twin girls talk to each other. We don't have a clue what they're saying. But they already know how to do it. Oh, I needed sound after all. If I plug this in, let's see if we can get some sound here real quick. Linda and crew work wonders. Well, think we could do sound? Okay. Here, we'll do it on the next one. What is that? What is that? Got no clue, but I think she's right. All done? I was filming this video thought for the day on our grandson's first birthday party. And, and watch him. Now these two words, they're translated steadfast love and faithfulness. Yes, that's it. They're very important words. Uh-huh. They're very important words. They, um, in the Hebrew, steadfast, yes. Uh, he wants me to set him down for just a moment, and then I'll resume this. So hang on. <laughs> I, I had to set him down because he was wanting to talk. Communication, it's the way we're hardwired. The Bible is God communicating to humanity through language. It's not the only way he does it. He did it in Jesus. He does it in actions. He does it in the world around us. But a principal way is through language. It's God communicating. If I've got time, just real briefly, I want to, and we'll get into this more later on, but I want to give you a communication model. I, I teach some communication stuff. Um, let's see. Boom. I teach communication theory. Um, and this is just a very basic. So if you say, well, it's pretty basic. Well, yeah, I just said it was basic. Basic communication model applied to the Bible. Wait, before we do it up to the Bible, let's do a basic communication model. You've got two people. You've got a sender and you've got a receiver. Now, the sender has a message that they want to send. Okay? It, whoops, there we go. A message that they want to send. And what they have to do is encode the message. In other words, you're a sender. You got some idea, something you want to communicate. First thing you got to do is put it into words. You got to encode it. And then you've got a receiver over here who's going to get it. But you got to take what you've encoded and you got to 
channel, find the channel, how you're going to send it over there. For me right now, I've thought of this stuff by God's grace, and I'm teaching it to you today, but my channel is my words and my electronic medium. And that's how I'm using it, but the, what the sender does is sends over to the receiver. And then the receiver's first thing they do is decode, try to understand what it is that's being sent. So you're listening to me, you're trying to understand. We can add some more to this. I told you this is pretty simple. In the process of transmitting from me or from, from a sender to a receiver, there can be interference that happens. It's, some call it noise. You might have trouble listening to me right now because your neighbor keeps elbowing you, telling you something. Or you might be the neighbor elbowing someone else, telling them something. Or you might be distracted because you're getting hungry or you're wondering how long this guy's going to drone on. All of that's noise. Now, we can take this basic communication model with the noise and et cetera, and when we receive it, we give feedback to the sender. So I can watch you and I can see where it's time to move on. I can see when someone nods their head like this and someone goes, that's feedback. And it's helpful because it helps me change the way I'm sending the message. I've got a select group of y'all who write me after every class and say, hey, this stuff worked, this stuff didn't. And that feedback enables me to be a better teacher, I hope. So that's what's happening. Now, we can apply this to the Bible. And that's where I wanted to do it here. Let's take it and apply it to the Bible. In biblical thought, the sender is God. So God has a message, and he's encoded that message in the Bible. And that Bible gets sent to us. Now, noise can happen in the process of sending it. We can have, uh, uh, you know, the, the King James was published in 1611. Then they published another edition a couple of years later. It's now called the Wicked Bible because they had... Uh, a typo in the printing. They left out the word not in a critical place, and that totally changed the meaning. And so they recalled all of those and tried to destroy them. That was noise. It got in the way. If you're a trivia buff and you want to know where it was, Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not commit adultery, read, thou shalt commit adultery. <laughs> I'm not lying. But we've got noise that can happen and this is manuscript changes and things like you've heard then when we receive the bible this decoding that is bible study that's what we're doing we're trying to understand what god meant to send our feedback is things like prayer things like how we live and they show what, and, and over time, as God's sending his word out, Israel is getting, God's getting live feedback. He's having to send more word out because of the feedback he's getting. But this is a, a basic communication model. Now, where does this take us? This is a little bit of the, the why, or the what, I should say. And now we get to number three, the how. So how do we do this in four minutes? This is your warm-up. First of all, you got to get your gear. There are certain things you need to do good Bible study. Okay? You know the first thing you need? You need a Bible. You get them here, you get it on the internet, get it where you want to get it, get a good Bible. You need a pen and something to make notes with. Huge difference. Dale Carnegie said, different Dale. Dale Carnegie said, the rapidity with which we forget is astonishing. So we write it down. We make notes. But the most important, and lots of tools. I mean, I can, we're going to go into all of this. This is all coming up. But I got to tell you, part of your gear to get is the sender. You want God's Holy Spirit to help you understand. You want to decode 
by using the help of the encoder. And God will put his Holy Spirit in you and, and help you understand if you're seeking him in that way. So lots of tools you can use, but it starts with your attitude. We need an attitude that says, Lord, I want to hear from you. I want to understand you better. I want to live the promises that Paul made to Timothy. I'm willing to change my life if you teach me to. I'm willing to change my attitude if you want me to. I might even vote for the other political party if you think I should. All right, well, let's don't push it that far. I just lost a couple of you on both sides of the aisle. <laughs> But no, I mean, just say, I put it all on the altar. Everything is fair game for God to modify if you'll teach me through your word. I just want to know you and what you are saying to me, and I want to understand it. So that is the why, what, and how. We'll get into all of that in more depth as we go along, but I got to give you some points for home, and they're out of Scripture. Paul also said to Timothy, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. That's what I want to do. I want to commit to rightly handling God's scripture. I want you to commit to that with me. I won't make a show of hands, but I ask you inside just to make that decision. Make it to God. Lord, I commit to you. I'm going to spend this summer learning Scripture better. Paul said to the Romans, whatever was written in former days, he's talking about the Old Testament, was written for our instruction today. And the same can be true now of the entire Bible. That through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. Don't despair. There is hope available, and you'll find the hope as you spend time in the Word. You get hope. And then, from the former days, Joshua, the Bible at that point is really down to like just maybe five books. And, and uh, you got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Joshua is told, the Word of the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. You'll meditate on it day and night, so you may be careful to do according to all that's written in it. Then you will make your way prosperous. You'll have good success. Whoa! Prosper and good success. I'm into that. That's a wow. We'll get it, study in the Word. So here's your homework and then we're done. Homework simple. Your assignment is this. For next week, should you wish. Just kind of make a list. What are the core storylines of the Bible? It's a library, but it's got these narratives that run all the way through. It's a library, in a sense, written by one being. So what are those core storylines? And we'll pick back up there next week. I'm sorry I went two minutes over. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask your blessings on all who hear this word, that you will captivate our hearts and our minds with your word, with what your message is to us, that you'll invigorate us and get us excited about hearing and studying and applying your word in our life. That's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. See you guys next Sunday.